You're listening to the Tilehurst End Podcast by Reading fans for Reading fans. Hello and welcome to the Tilehurst End Podcast, sponsored by ZCZ Films. I'm your host, Mark Mayo, and this week I am delighted to bring you our latest podcast interview of the lockdown period, this time with first team defender Tom McIntyre. Tom, who joined the club in his very early years, about six or seven as he was as he came into the academy and stayed there all the way through until making his first team debut against Rotherham last year. And it was a well, quite an interesting debut as we discuss, as he uh, sustained quite a serious injury in that, but he's been playing again this season and has been in and out the team a little bit on the bench and with injuries and stuff as well. His injury clearing up just before the lockdown period ended, so he'll be back in the first team squad for the resumption of the championship. We discussed things with his teammates, to his time supporting the club as he went home and away with Reading in his early years and now on the pitch as one of those first team heroes that Reading fans have certainly taken to. So without further ado, please welcome Tom McIntyre to the Tarnhurst End. Be loud and be proud and back the boys and make some noise. Come on, you Oz! Shout out to this week's podcast sponsor, ZCZ Films, showing that age is no barrier to being a hooli hoop. Tom McIntyre, welcome to the Tyler stand. On a, as we were just talking off air, the weird moment we hopefully would be able to do these sort of interviews in person at the moment, but as it is, a nice chat about what was a very interesting scenario. So how's it going, mate? Yes, mate, thanks for having me. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm all good, mate. It's a bit strange, isn't it, doing a, a podcast over the phone, but yeah, here we are. Yeah, absolutely, and it, it, we're finding new ways to to keep ourselves amused. And before we get onto all the the you know the football and the playing, I suppose to to one extent this is the football. The first question I have to ask is your secret to the FIFA success that you've been having during the lockdown. How has it how has it been uh, doing all that sort of stuff? To be fair, I wouldn't even I, I don't know whether that's the right word to describe it as a success. Uh, losing in the second round of the uh, the quarantine cup, but I, I did my best, but. I don't know, I think against the pro I was never going to win. Um, but it was all a bit of fun and that, and I think people sort of got behind it and saw it for what it was uh, as a bit of fun and like raising money for a good cause and stuff. But um, no, it, it, it kept me busy during during the start of quarantine. So no, it was I, I enjoyed it, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's interesting the sort of things that people do latch on to in this period, and that certainly was one of the, you know, overall one of the success stories as well. And and yourself as well it's a you know as a young player it's probably a bit of a strange time to have the you know your career effectively put on hold as it is how was it at the start of of lockdown then with the training and and what sort of you know what sort of things were you doing sort of day to day to keep yourself fit and everything like that um it was sort of doubly frustrating for me as well because because I'd just been out injured literally my the week that I was meant to be back training was the week we went into lockdown and sort of we all had to be at home and stuff so um that was sort of another thing that made me even more frustrated because it had been such a long time since I'd trained with the boys and I was sort of looking forward to that and then yeah to be told you've just got to stay in for the next sort of the foreseeable future was a bit of a shock but I don't know I I found it tough at at first because you obviously don't have a routine but I think once you get into a routine and stuff I think it's uh just sort of I don't know it's it's not been too bad to be fair there's people who have it a lot worse than I do so I just got to be grateful for what I have really but I think yeah like I said that was the main thing is just having a routine that you you do every day um, because you could just sit about and be a couch potato all day if you wanted to Um, but yeah it's important to get those routines going yeah and are you now back at Bearwood training on a how's that working is that kind of an individual basis you're going in um, so now, as of Monday, we're in, in in groups. So the defenders will be at a certain time, and then the midfielders will be at another time, and then the strikers another time as well. I'm um, sort of all spaced out throughout the day. Um, but it's great to be back training with the boys and stuff, and even just seeing them and be able be, being able to just sort of have a little chat with them and stuff and, and catch up. Because going from being with them every day to then not seeing them at all is is a bit, is a bit strange. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of uh, a lot of stuff we missed out on, but no, it's been it's been great to to get on the grass again because there's only sort of so much you can do on your own. Um, you can obviously do a lot of running and that, but it's never the same as getting on a pitch and training with your your teammates, sort of thing. 
Yeah, I suppose it must be, it's unique as a defender as well, because you're, the nature of your job is you're dealing with the person and the opposite team. You can't just, you know, pick up, have a few pot shots no. at goal, can you? So it must be weird to have to deal with that. Yeah, yeah, definitely it is, because at the minute we're not actually contact, it's not contact training at the minute, so it's a lot of passing drills and sort of like we're doing patterns of play. But yeah, like you say, it is hard as a defender, because I just want to tackle someone really, and that's my <laughs> sort of... That's what I love doing is tackling people and heading the ball and stuff. So, no, it is a bit frustrating, yeah. But you should, everyone's in the same boat, aren't they? So, yeah. What uh, what positives have you been able to take from this period? Have you had a chance to maybe do a bit more like video analysis? Maybe you know get a bit more of a tactical insight into what's going on. Have Have you been able to take anything like that? Um, it would just be sort of like injury prevention exercises and stuff, and. Uh, like running and keeping fit and I, I feel like I've really sort of I feel strong and I, I, f- I feel good in my body and stuff and I think that's important with me because I've, ha- I've over the years I've picked up a few injuries and stuff um, and often during the the summer holidays when you when you're usually off um, you, you, you obviously do try and stick to the program as much as you can but when you're away at, on holiday or whatever the hotels sometimes don't have the stuff that you need but at home I've been able to sort of get enough of what I need to get those sort of exercises done that prevent injuries and stuff from happening and my dad uh, was able to help me uh, because he has a van he was able to pick up one of the bikes from the training ground so I brought that home Mm. and then a bit of the gym equipment and stuff so I think the main thing really is just sort of doing all of those sort of like leg strength and exercises and stuff which has been massive for me because I've obviously had so much time you can really focus on that sort of thing yeah yeah, because it was an ankle injury you had as we were sort of, you know, playing before yeah. lockdowns or whatever. Is that you saying that's all cleared up now, basically? Yeah, that was the other thing as well. Because I, I would have started back um, playing the week that we went into lockdown. Um, but as with any injury in sort of a sports team, they try and get you back as quick as they can. And maybe in a perfect world, you probably need a bit longer to recover from an ankle injury like that. So it's given me an extra sort of, it's given me a few more extra months for the ankle to heal as well so in that sense it's sort of a blessing in disguise really um and also if i jumped back into the team uh training then i'd have been behind a bit with in terms of fitness and stuff but obviously now we're all going back at the same time we're all sort of coming back on a level playing field sort of yeah thing. yeah um, absolutely so no I, I i do remember yeah now that you mentioned it that was i've obviously forgot about that positive because that was obviously a long time ago but yeah no that is that is a massive one um just give me a bit of extra time to heal yeah yeah i suppose things that happened at the start of lockdown do feel like they're about five years ago i don't know i know yeah honestly yeah (laughs) nightmare and you said um about going in and training and stuff have you i understand that it's bearwood now that we're kind of using rather than hogwood the old training ground what have you had a good chance to look around the new training ground what's your sort of impressions of it Oh no, I love it to be fair. It's uh, it's something that when we've always gone to, well, as a youngster, you obviously go to other academies and and play against their youth teams, which is always at the or usually at the training grounds. And our training grounds obviously great at Hogwood as well. But you see some of these amazing state of the art facilities that they've got at other clubs, and you always think oh, it'd be cool if we had that, or if we could get that swimming pool, or that big gym at our at our place. So now to sort of have stuff like that. Uh, and have it as a state-of-the-art facility is just going to be great for not only the first team but all the teams the women's team and then the academy and i think just for reading as a club and as a whole um i think it's going to be going to be brilliant and the the benefits of that will uh will be endless yeah yeah, it's one of those things that as fans I, we don't we don't get to see. But I've been I've been to Hogwood a few times. And it's it's an, yeah. it's nice, but it's kind of it feels a bit temporary if you know what I mean. Whereas Bearwood hopefully is a you know yeah. permanent structure now, really, isn't it? Yeah, people often say that who, who visit and stuff. They say that, but I don't know. For for us, I know it, maybe for people that are visiting, it seems temporary. But for for us, that's sort of our our home from home sort of thing. So yeah. Um, yeah. No, we like it's got everything it needs and it's it's brilliant the pitches are unbelievable the ground staff are a, a top draw but yeah as, as i say the state-of-the-art facilities that are now going to be at bearwood is just gonna help us no end yeah absolutely and in terms of your you know getting back in now with the teammates and everything obviously there's gonna be a lot of catching up to do although in terms of being in the dressing room kind of like you would typically is going to be yeah. a bit different for a few weeks and months now how has it been 
you know, con- being staying in contact with the other teammates? Have you had you know, Zoom calls together, been yeah. able to con- keep in contact quite a lot? Uh, yeah, we actually have a group chat, so a, a lot of talking goes on on that. Um, and we've had we had a few meetings over the first few weeks with the manager and stuff on on Zoom calls. So yeah, it's a bit awkward when there's sort of twenty sort of twenty to thirty lads all on the same Zoom call. It's a bit a bit loud and noisy, but <laughs> no, it was good. It was good to like catch up with them then. Um, but there's also been a group of us that have done a um, a pub. We've done like a pub sort of quiz on a Friday. Uh, that stopped now, but for the first few weeks of lockdown, um, we did a we did a, uh, a quiz every Friday. So the loser would have to do the quiz the next week. So no, that was that was a good bit of fun, and we could all catch up every week. Um, and those are the sort of things that you need during this time. Is it's something to look forward to, really, because at the start it sort of seems like you're just just going through life with no sort of purpose. But that was just a little something that sort of gave us something to look forward to. Yeah. Yeah, it's weird. I must say myself, it seems like I'm talking to some of my friends much more now than I ever was before, really. Oh, definitely. Yeah, definitely. I think that's that's the same with a lot of people. And it's the same with sort of your family. And I know this is a bit of a different topic, but being with your family and stuff, I've never spent so much time with my family because we've obviously been at home non-stop. Everyone has busy lives and stuff. So I think everyone's got to sort of look at it as, as a bit of a positive in that sense, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Who's who's coming bottom of those pub quizzes then? Which which sort of players are struggling on the general knowledge? <laughs> to be fair, the first quiz I jumped in, I lost, um, which was pretty embarrassing because I didn't actually play a lot. I didn't do the quiz for the first few weeks. I then jump in and I lose straight away, which is a bit <laughs> frustrating. Um, but who else would give me a run for money down the bottom? Matt Miazga. Me and him have a little thing going on, and I, I reckon I'm. I'm brighter than he is but he reckons he's brighter than I am so I think me and him would sort of <laughs> come pretty far down the pack uh, alongside Liam Moore to be fair I, he's he, yeah he's down there as well I reckon but it'd be a tough one between us three I reckon a lot of centre-backs there is there some sort of theme between spending your time heading a ball and jumping into people <laughs> <laughs> yeah maybe it has an effect on you I don't know <laughs> <laughs> takes, a, takes a certain type doesn't it yeah defo yeah yeah, just a bit of one serious question before I, I was going to talk about teammates and everything like that in a yeah. second. But one serious question is the wage deferral has now been agreed for, I think it's three months now. I presume yeah. yourself as a sort of younger player wasn't too much involved. Correct me if I'm wrong, of course, but I'd imagine yeah. that maybe the older players and everything like that. What was your sort of experience of that being dealt with? Um, to be fair, that was all sorted, yeah, as you say, by the senior players. Um, and I think Liam Moore... Uh, has done a great job at um, sort of like spe- liaising with Nigel Howe and uh, the gaffer as well and I think he's been brilliant for us as players because he's been our voice sort of thing and, and spoke to the PFA a lot and stuff uh, but what he's got sorted is, is good for the club and, and us as players um, so we've all got to thank him for that I think because yeah, he's, he's done a really good job as as our captain he's, he's been our voice and yeah, no, I think that's, it's been great with him yeah no, nah, fair enough. Well, as I say, we'll talk about a couple of teammates. Then I want to throw just a handful of names at you that I'm quite interested to get your take on because yeah. I've seen as the uh, as you know when we're playing normally and everything like that. I see little snippets on your Instagram and everything of inside the dressing room and, and the characters yeah. in there and everything. And what 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 have you found as particularly as a young player of playing alongside and being in the dressing room alongside Charlie Adam because he's a player who. You know, he's he's been there, done it, bought the T-shirt and everything like that. He's also in the media a lot. Is he is he yeah. the the wise old sort of almost like the grandpa of the group in a way? Yeah, he, he is. He, well, I think that might be a bit harsh. You wouldn't like that. If I <laughs> that. But, um, but no, he's he's a top guy, and and he's yeah, as you say, he's got so much knowledge of the game and and been around for a long time that uh, I think for a player like myself who's who's young and coming through, I think. It's just, that's just invaluable to me really um, and I really feel like I can <laughs> sort of speak to him and he'll give me advice on stuff um, but also he doesn't take himself too seriously as well which sometimes you get sort of older pros uh, who come down and they might sort of I don't know, sometimes when a, maybe a young player says something to them they might take it in a wrong way um, but I, I can have a real good laugh and a joke with Charlie and stuff and, and he takes it the right way you know so uh no, he's a really good guy, and yeah, he's, he's really funny as well. To be fair, I think uh, some of the things he does in the dressing room, yeah, do make us laugh. 
Yeah, no, I get that sense a lot. Particularly, I see a lot of golf swings and golf chat going on in the dressing room yeah. as well. Yeah. Yeah, no, golf's a big part of the dressing room, to be fair. Everyone's on it, as, as well as darts as well. We're into our darts too. And another player I want to talk about who is probably on the opposite end, if you, you know, Charlie Adams in the media and everything like that, we very rarely hear of, of, of Ovi Ajari and what he, you know, yeah. I don't really see him too much on social media. I don't even know if he has an Instagram account, yeah. for example. Um, what's he kind of, is, is, it, is it that kind of understatement maybe more with him? Yeah, he's just a really a, a quiet guy, really. Um, really nice fella as well. But yeah, he, he doesn't. He's not like outspoken or anything. He keeps himself to himself, and he's he's quite a private private guy. Uh, he speaks to a lot. I, I'd say he probably speaks to a lot of the younger players more than he speaks to like senior players. You know, because mm. um, I think I've, I've had quite a few conversations with him and stuff. Because I sit next to him on the uh, on the coach on the way up to away games. Um, so I've got to know him quite well and. Yeah, he's a really nice guy. Um, but yeah, he, he he doesn't. He's yeah, he's just he's just a very quiet guy, I think. But I think that sort of adds to the magic of him as a player, though, um, because he is so quiet and sort of introverted, uh, like off the pitch. When you see him on the pitch and how sort of you know dominant and like just just classy is on the pitch, it's, it's I, I think that's amazing in itself, really. Yeah, it is that kind of it's his the way of playing his game is kind of the most extroverted and and artistic, yeah. isn't it? Which is, as you say, kind of the opposite. Exactly. Yeah, I think that that adds that adds to it. Yeah. And tell me about um, Aya Masika, who's obviously only been at the club for you know obviously only really a few weeks before obviously the lockdown yeah. began, but the thing that we noticed as fans, I don't know if you noticed it in the dressing room, was just the sheer, the Kenyan following that just emerged overnight, basically, as we signed yeah. someone. How has, how has he been to sort of, you know, be training against and, and in the dressing room? Uh, to be fair, on, on the pitch, I haven't really got to know him too well because he came in and I was injured at the time. Mm. Um, I haven't actually trained with him. Or I trained with him once or twice, sorry. He came in just as I, just before I got injured. Um, but off the pitch, again, he's he's a nice guy and he's got to know all the lads really well and stuff. Um, but yeah, he wears some dodgy gear though. I'd say that to him. <laughs> he wears some dodgy gear. Um, but you'd never know you never know how massive he is in Kenya. Um, just talking to him because he's he's really down to earth and that. Um, and that that that's that's the same about all the lads really. Everyone's there's not one player in the dressing room that I dislike or isn't a nice person. I think everyone in the dressing room is like real nice guys um, but yeah his, his gear's awful but he's a good guy that's what I'd say <laughs> what constitutes <laughs> I'm always curious when it comes to football is what constitutes awful gear because as, as you know on social media and stuff there's quite a lot of what I would describe as questionable material but then yeah. what you guys consider that it might be completely different he wore like it, that was so he's worn some dodgy stuff and it's all nice like good material good material expensive gear but there was one day he came in in like a trench coat, like <laughs> Inspector Morse or something. I don't know. It was really strange. And it was like a full black trench coat. And none of the lads were having that at all. Um, but yeah, just loud, like bright stuff. Not for me, but it, it, I suppose you could say he pulls it off. And it's a different kind of uh, different kind of sort of fashion, I suppose. Um but yeah, he's he's himself, I suppose. At least he's not. At least he's not afraid to wear what he wants. Because sometimes you pull out a bright top or something and think, oh, I might not wear that because I'll get grilled for that. <laughs> um, but but clearly he isn't worried about that. So fair play to him. No, absolutely. If you can if you can style it out, then then crack yeah. on sort of thing. And and one other player I wanted to mention specifically because this is someone who I feel like you know as as fans we appreciate him a lot. And but as as a personality. I think he kind of goes under the radar a little bit and is actually, in my opinion, maybe one of the most important players in the dressing room. And that's Andy Yeardom, who yeah. perhaps, you know, as I say, a bit low-key outside of the game. But inside, what's he? is he actually, uh, you know, a, quite a big character, actually? Yeah, he is. He's a real big character. Um, and he's a leader as well in the dressing room. Um, and I think you see that with his performances as well. He'll, he'll give his 110%. You sometimes see him I see him sort of. I've been on the bench a few times and seen him twenty minutes in, and he looks like he's he's blowing out his backside. It, it, it looks like that, but literally he'll just keep up the same work rate throughout the whole ninety minutes. Um, 
and yeah, it's, it's amazing to be fair. How hard he works. Um, but yeah, in the dressing room, he's a, he's a he's a strong voice and a strong character and someone. But yeah, a, a senior player who I'd look up to myself. Um, but yeah, he, he, again, he's he's a he's a top guy off the pitch as well. Um, he'll always have time to talk to you and stuff. And uh, he's obviously had a lot of experience with his journey coming up through through non-league and stuff. So yeah, slightly different to other players in the team. Um, but yeah, he's, he he might he might be the one to sort of pull you to the side and maybe just speak to you quietly, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And and that's I suppose as well what I was thinking earlier on in terms of you know you come across as someone who doesn't probably doesn't come across as like starstruck or overwhelmed or anything like that. But did you ever feel when you were first in the senior dressing room a bit like oh god what am I doing here? Sort of a bit starstruck players around me that you've heard of on the TV yeah. that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. At first, it is it is strange. I would I'd be lying if I said it wasn't. Um, and I think often young players and stuff make out that they're not starstruck or like that doesn't affect them. But yeah, definitely. When I first when I first started training with the first team and played for the first team, it was it was a bit strange for myself. Not in a not in a bad way. It was. I think it actually helps really because you've got that sort of fear factor in a sense of the players that you've watched growing up and stuff and you know how you know about all what they've done in their careers and you're trying to prove to them what you can do if that makes sense mm. um, but yeah at first it is really strange because obviously you watch these players like uh, G Mac and Guns and that and Liam Moore I've watched them I've watched them for years you know uh, since they've been at Reading and I've been to see them play at Wembley and stuff and then yeah to be playing with them it's, it's amazing really yeah I would say to their faces though. I hope they don't listen. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll do we'll do a, a, a tiny little edit for Twitter and put it out like a forty-five second bit. So maybe I'll put out a bit where you you know you can say something where you're really good, and then we'll put that out on social media. Speaking <laughs> of which, funny. actually, who is who's the worst one to face in training? Out of, you know, whether it's an attacker or a midfielder or whatever, who is the the one that you kind of dread, thinking, are oh, they going to give me a either a you know a, a real physical day or, or just a going to tie me out? It's probably got to be Ovi Ajaria, to be fair, because um, you obviously see what he does on a pit on a pitch on a Saturday, mm. and then when you get in training against him, I think he probably doesn't embarrass people as much as he does on a Saturday because people know what he's like and know how good he is. People tend to sort of stand off him slightly in training, or I do anyway, <laughs> uh, because you know what he can do. I'm sometimes a bit wary of getting nutmegged by him or something, but uh, I'll probably go with him to be fair. And who is the you 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 are allowed to say yourself with this one, but who is the funniest man in the dressing room? It's got to be Charlie or Sam Baldock, I'd say. Got to be. Yeah, Sam yeah, Baldock did Adam that. Sam Baldock. Sam Baldock did that Instagram like joke yeah. thing for the club, didn't yeah, he? Yeah. When he like called called people up and everything. Was that was that sort of thing that he's you know he's good at doing that sort of comedy sort of routine? Yeah. He, he's just got like clever banter uh, and like witty banter you know like he'll come out with comments that you won't ever think of and it might sometimes it takes me a few seconds to pick up on it because <laughs> he's that quick um, but yeah he's just a funny he's just a funny bloke he, he can make a joke out of anything really um, so yeah it's got to be him or, or Charlie just I think Scottish people in general are just they just have something about them that makes them funny I think <laughs> I suppose with Charlie as well, he has that. He's he's got that sort of level of authority as well, and may, maybe it's that yeah. deadpanness as as well that he's got to him. Yeah, for sure. It might it might be a bit of that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's um let's talk a bit about the um you know your sort of playing days and everything like that then because you you managed to come into the um, youth team at a really young age and what what was the sort of circumstances of the club effectively signing you up because you must have. It, it was sort of you were almost too young to be in a sort of scouting sense I'd imagine yeah. um, so when I when I played originally for um, my like Sunday league team if you will uh, I played a year up uh, just from the start I can't remember why I, I think it, I think I went to the tra- I think I went to train with my age group and they could obviously they could maybe see that I was like a bit bigger and stronger than some of the other lads so just pushed me up an age group straight away um, so yeah, for the first few years of my like footballing journey, I was playing a year uh, a year up, and then I remember there was a I think it was a scout a scout came to watch my team play in a tournament or something, a little like five a side tournament, 
and they picked three of the lads uh, to go and train, and I wasn't one of them. Um, and my manager, my manager spoke to the guy after and said, "Like, mate, you've not taken Tom, <laughs> and I consider him one of my best players." This is what he's told me. Um, and so they they did give me a chance in the end, and I, I went along with these other three from my team. Um, and I, I trained. I think it was every Friday. I trained down at the dome. Um, but every every few weeks you'd get a letter to say whether you'd been kept on or not for the next sort of six week cycle. Mm. Um, so my mum and dad would, would always prepare. Well, I can't remember this, but they'd always prepare me for me, me to get a letter that said, "Oh, we don't we don't want you to carry on." Um, but luckily, yeah, that never came. Uh, and then it got to sort of, I think I was maybe seven, and they started obviously signing the boys in my age group. In, my, in the year above who were eight at the time so you can join I think under eight it was at the time uh, and it came to me signing and for whatever reason they didn't realise that I was a year below um, so I then had to, I then had to just do the same what I was doing for another year and then I did get signed up in the end Yeah. Um, so I think looking back on it I probably from an early age playing up an age group probably helped me a lot I'd say um, but yeah that's where the journey started and were you a, a defender at this point, or was it just kind of was there no real positioning you were kind of favouring to? Was it when was it um, a defending? Defending became your sort of thing. Yeah, I'd always sort of be further towards the back. Uh, I'd often sometimes play midfield in like five aside in five aside and stuff. But again, at that age, there's not really a structure to the team. Yeah. Um, but I think it was either centre back or like just in the middle, like defensive midfield, really. And what uh, sort? And can you remember whether it's, you know, probably not like seven-year-old, but maybe like 13, 15, 17-year-old yeah. you get into, what sort of players were that you remember maybe playing with or playing against that have, that have made it to the game as well now? Um, we've got, got loads, to be fair. There's Mason Mount, uh, Declan Rice, uh, Sancho. Um, I remember playing Marcus Rashford when I was under 15s. Uh, who else have we got? Cause there's, there's quite a few to be fair. You see, mm. it's brilliant to be fair because I'm at that age now where I'm obviously a bit older, and you see a lot, a lot of the boys who are playing at my age now. I've played against before, which is is brilliant to see. Um, but there, there, there'd be a there'd be a huge list of players that I played against who are now playing. But I, I always I, I buzz off it to be fair when I see lads I've played against playing in first teams and stuff. No matter whether it's in the conference, in League Two, League One, whatever it is, uh, I always. I think it's great when I see players that I've played against playing in first teams and stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Who was the one that you can remember then who maybe, you know, you could admit maybe tore you apart or something like that or was just you thought this guy's going to be really good? Uh, I remember it was, it was always the Chelsea team. Uh, at this point, Declan Rice was still playing with Chelsea. I don't know how, I don't know why they released him to be fair because he was always one of the best players in their team. Mm. So they had... Mason Mount playing attacking midfield. They had Trevor Chaloba playing at the back with uh, Dijon Sterling. They had um, obviously Declan in midfield, uh, Callum Hudson Odoi, and then there was another few players in their team. But whenever we played them, you'd always know that you were going to be in for a game, and you'd probably say they were the best team growing up. Um, but yeah, it'd probably be maybe maybe Ma- Mason was up there. Yeah, I'd probably say Mason was one of the best I played against. Yeah. Yeah, to be fair, that team at under seventeen would probably give most like League One teams now a good run for their money, yeah. wouldn't they? That's an immense yeah, level of talent in that team. Yeah, yeah, for sure. There was also, to be fair, at that age, there was also Eddie and who plays for. He was at Chelsea at that point. Oh yeah, he's, yeah. He's, he's now at Arsenal, but he was in that team as well. And I remember, yeah, they used to be so good. Yeah. And then you know you you managed to make the transition yourself from academy to I suppose it's kind of academy to reserve and then to senior effectively, isn't it? But yeah. what did you find was the big sort of difference that you had to make the step up from from youth to senior football? Um, I think it's just like the physicality of it all and the, the importance on a game and the, and the pressure that's on you uh, to perform. Um, and I think you don't you don't realise that straight away. It's when you're around the environment more and you see the stresses that uh, it puts people under in, in the team and in the staff, you know, and you, you realise how important it all is. Because um, I think growing up, you always see it as being amazing and you watch football all the time, but you don't see that that other side of it, you know. 
Um, and you, you don't you don't ever realise it until you're actually in it, if you know what I mean. Yeah, and I suppose there'd be no more school as well. Must have been a, a kind of kind of weird thing in a sense, is it? When you're going from from mixing training with with advising and everything like that to thinking yeah. this is now just my full time job. Yeah, yeah. But to be fair, that was what I wanted to do from when I was sort of when I started playing football. And then, yeah, when you finally get to that point where you think, right, this is my job now, and this is what I'll do full time. I think that's just brilliant, really, because you can just put all your focus into that. Mm, absolutely, and then we've got the. Uh, I suppose it's it's typic- the typical question I would ask of your debut. Obviously, the Rotherham game. Yeah. Um, the typical question I would ask is, "What are your memories from that?" But with you, yeah. I've got to ask, "Have you got any memories from that?" <laughs> because for those of those who may not remember, you what was the official injury that you sh- suffered during that game? Uh, I fractured my frontal sinus, which is in layman's terms, it's your, your, the front of your skull, basically. And that was, is, is that okay now? Have you still got any kind of remnants of that injury in your head now? Um, I've just got a big whopping scar down the side of my head, which you can you can probably see, you, you see it most of the time. When my hair's longer, it sort of covers it up. Um, and you can also sort of feel a little little two screws in the, in the top of my head. But apart from that, there's uh, it, it's all good touch wood. Um, but yeah, it was, it was a worrying time, that, yeah. You're just still setting the metal detectors off if you, as you go on your flights, Stan. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, he said that the surgeon said that to me in the uh, when I first went to see him. He did say that this is a special kind of material that doesn't get set off in uh, metal detectors. But yeah, I, I do get asked that all the time. <laughs> and that obviously, you know, the the overwhelming feeling of that debut was, you know, must have been immense. I've read that you had all your family up there as well. How was the how was the the nerves the night before that game? Yeah, to, to be fair, it, it, this this is a bit cliche, but it's all like before is just all a bit of a blur, really, because um, it was such a quick. It, it felt like not not that I was chucked in, but there was no one else who could play at that time. Mm. I think we had loads of the centre backs were out injured, and I sort of just had to just just chuck myself into it, really. Um, but I think that's the best thing that could have happened because, as I said, I didn't have too much time to think about. I think it may have been. I remember I might have trained on the Wednesday or Thursday and I remember Liam pulled out with a calf strain or something um, and then I was looking over and, and he's like walking off and all the lads are like slapping me on the head and that going oh you're going to start you're going to start and then Shawnee Shawnee said something to me like don't be nervous it's not that bad <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah the, the nerves did start from as soon as I seen Liam go in because I knew that that was probably going to be me playing <coughs> um but I just it's just those sort of few days and then the few days after were just the be- the best in my life really yeah yeah it must have been surreal to to come out and as someone you've said before that you used to follow the team home and away to come out and be like the one clapping the away fans and everything it must be yeah. to to sort of be the one you're watching in a sense isn't it yeah it was just the yeah it was it was it was unbelievable I can't even I can't even describe it really it was just something that uh I think about it all the time as well because although I did obviously have the nasty head clash and that, all I think about from that game is just good memories and and that time. So uh, no, I'm I'm so grateful grateful for it all sort of happening like that. Yeah. Yeah, we'll talk about your your sort of supporting club time, like as a fan in a yeah. minute. But to, as you went into the next summer. Um, it was kind of a really that summer under Jose Gomez was a really quiet summer um, in yeah. terms of transfer activity and everything. There were a lot of academy players being involved. There was a three at the back as well. Um, yeah. This was this kind of a, a confident time for you where you thought there's a really good chance I'm going to be involved here. Uh, yeah, I did. I, I did because obviously there wasn't being there wasn't any sort of incomings in terms of signings and stuff. Um, and yeah. Pro- Primarily, the team was was filled with 23s players, which for me and all of us youngsters was was brilliant because you're always looking to get your chance at some stage. Um, but I think as a young player, you do realise that that's maybe not what happens all the time, and that players were going to come in. Um, but yeah, it was it was great to be away. There was so many players that maybe wouldn't have gone on uh, preseason tours that managed managed to get on preseason tours, which I think will just help people out no end um, but yeah as, as I say it's it's you, you, I'm, I'm, maybe people sort of 
maybe some of us younger players thought that we sort of got sucked in by the fact that there was no signings coming in maybe so we thought maybe there was places for us when really it was sort of a full it was a full sense of security you know mm. um, but yeah it was, it was a very like strange time for the club I think um, with what was going on but um, it's something that helps you as a person and as a player because of the ups and downs of it yeah yeah, when you had the, um, you did have in the, the first few weeks, you had a few games, obviously, like starting in that three at the back as well. You had your first wins with the Wickham and the Huddersfield game. Yeah. How sort of satisfying was it to get, especially after that Huddersfield game, which was, you know, you started it, it a pretty straightforward win in all respects. It was some of the best football we played that season. How satisfying yeah. was it to think, this is it, I've got a win under my belt now, that's, that's it? Yeah. No, that was, that was a brilliant memory as well, was that game. That would be probably up there with, Maybe my debut and that were probably my best memories and the Wickham game I'd say um, and I, I thought that's one of my better performances that I've had in the first team that I was I was really pleased with really because I remember I was watching and we were really under the cosh in the first sort of 10-15 minutes and Matt obviously got injured then but I was looking from the outside thinking cool like the game the game was being played at some pace and they were really pressing us high um, but then yeah as I, as I come on I think Sometimes when a game is that quick and frantic at the start and you come into it as early as that, um, you just sort of, you just go off instinct, really. Um, and, and maybe if a game's slower um, and a bit more laboured at the back or whatever, you might you might be prone to a mistake or something, but I think you just needed to be straight on it from the start in that one. Um, but, but yeah, to... It was celebrating a goal as well. Celebrating goals when you're away, it's just a brilliant, brilliant feeling because you, the, the sort of stadium goes silent, but you can just hear our fans, <laughs> uh, which I think is sort of something that I, I don't know, I never really thought of before I was playing as a player, but it's just such a brilliant feeling to know you're in someone's backyard sort of scoring against them, you know? Well, it's that seeds mentality sort of joy of it, isn't it? The the fact yeah. that you've kind of you've gone there, and and that, I suppose that's why as a fan away days always have that sort of special element to it. Yeah, definitely, and I think you always uh, the away following's brilliant that we get, and uh, you can always hear hear the fans from start to finish and stuff, and especially when we we're, we're creating chances and scoring goals and winning games as well. It's just it's brilliant. Yeah, there's no better feeling. Yeah, absolutely, especially when we're at a club. I mean, let's face it, our fans are, I would I would strongly argue, underrated when it comes to all things atmosphere, especially with Club yeah. 1871 as the home games has now totally revamped the atmosphere at home. I think our fans do, we get sort of characterised as like a soft southern yeah. club when they're not necessarily the reality. Yeah, no, I take that personally as well when I see that on Twitter, people trying to <laughs> batter our support on that. And I've done, since I was young, when people would say stuff like that, it would always... It would always hurt me inside to see that, yeah. I suppose you've got to stop yourself as a professional from going on oh, Twitter yeah. and <laughs> giving it yeah, back. sometimes you have to bite your tongue, yeah. Um, that Wiccan game you mentioned, were you, did you ask to take a penalty in that? Did you think, oh, number eight, I'll be up here soon sort of thing? Um, to be fair, I would have taken a penalty, obviously, if it had got to me, but I think the... I'd played for... Was it the season before? I think it was the season before... We played. I'd played for the 23s in a playoff game, and I'd missed the pen. Mm. So that was slightly in my head, which I don't know. That yeah, I, I would have definitely taken a pen. I'd have stepped up confidently, but yeah, I leave that to the, the goal scorers. To be fair, <laughs> that's fair enough. And um, yeah. we had d- during the season, we obviously had um, Mark Bowen and coming in for. Jose Gomez and Mark, I presume, was someone you you know would have worked with to some extent yeah. because he was at the club before he became manager. How did life as a defender change for you with that sort of managerial swap? Um, yeah, it was brilliant to be fair. When him and Eddie came in, um, we hadn't sort of obviously all managers have different ways of working, don't they? Um, mm. And with uh, the manager before, we'd work a lot more on sort of patterns of play and. It would be more creating the the chances and stuff and, and possession and stuff. But when Eddie came in, uh, he he did. I, I remember his first session was like defending crosses, um, and it was really focused on the, the the defenders and sort of your positioning when defending crosses. And I think from that, I could instantly like I, I instantly took so much from that um, because we were doing sort of specific stuff 
with Eddie and the, the manager of like what positions you need to be in, body shapes. You shouldn't shouldn't turn your back at this point and stuff. And for me as a youngster, I'm trying to take all those little things on as much as I can to improve me as a as a player. Um, so yeah, since he's come in, I've I've loved the training and everything that he's been doing really. Yeah, because I suppose in a way, with Jose Gomez, you were classed him maybe as a more technical manager. But yeah. the Reading, the, the club has always tried to stress that the academy players, are they already know how to play with the ball. Because yeah. would you describe yourself you know, as a defender who is comfortable with the ball? Was that always drilled in you from an early age? Yeah, I'd like to say definitely that's one of my qualities is that I can, I can play on the ball and stuff. Um, but... But yeah, yeah. As you say, coming through the academy and stuff, uh, you, you're taught that from a really early age how to deal with the ball and how to pass the ball properly. Um, because yeah, everyone who comes through Reading should always have that sort of that backbone of being able to be good technically as a player, if nothing else, you know. Yeah, absolutely. And let's um, let's talk then as you as you know someone who's come through the academy while also as you've said before following the club home and away and everything like that and it's a unique situation really we've, we've you know we have hometown players in the yeah. dressing room before and we've obviously had fans of the of the club in the dressing room as well but do you and I suppose whether there's any other players in the dressing room who are sort of like diehard fans as it were do yeah. you recount to your teammates in the dressing room tales of 106 tales of 2012 and and sort of give them a bit of insight into that yeah Definitely, there's, there's sometimes comments that I'll make or whatever, or they'll ask me questions about, oh, Tom will know that, <laughs> uh, sort of thing. Um, but, but yeah, they sometimes say, oh, would you shut up about that? You're always going on about that. <laughs> but, but yeah, they're just, they're, they're obviously just messing about. But yeah, I, I, um, yeah, I like to, I like to express like how much Redding means to me and that towards them as well, because, uh, yeah, it, Redding's always been a big part of my life and, if, if if you're my friend as a person then you should know that I'm a massive Reading fan and stuff and that is something that uh, is part of me yeah and where was your favourite spot to watch games then from the Madstad so originally I sat with my dad in the Upper West um, but that was back when Y26 was, was jumping uh and I always begged my dad to let me go over there and sit and sit with them, but he always had his mates up in the Upper West, so um, mm. he had a group of them that would always go. So he didn't want his movie season ticket. Um, but sometimes me and my cousin would try and go under the barriers all the way round and and actually sit in uh, Y26. But sometimes you get stopped. You get you get from the West Stand to the North Stand, but then going round the back of the North Stand and trying to get into the East Stand they'd stop you and it's a bit more sort of cut off up where the drum is. Yeah, um, well, that's we, that's where I sit is up in that northeast corner, so I constantly see people going underneath the barrier and everything. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, no, I, I I just loved going to games when I was younger, yeah. And and there's the away, the away games as well. Was that under the old star coaches and everything, or how would, yeah. how would you always go yeah. about that? Yeah, I, I love the star coaches uh, going on them. I sort of did that a bit more when I was a bit older because um, obviously when I was a lot younger my dad would take me or my sort of uncle or whatever um, but I think actually my cousin used my season ticket as and so his, his mate wanted to go to a game with him a few years back and I obviously didn't go so he took my season ticket and got on the star coaches with my season ticket but he was sick on the bus <laughs> on the way back so I think I'm bad my season ticket's banned from the star coaches <laughs> Um, which was quite funny when I heard that, but uh, but yeah, just going to going to away games and the buzz that you have. Uh, I remember when we went to Leicester away, uh, when we went up, that was probably my best memory as an away day, um, and something that that will stick with me for the rest of my life too was um, was that day because that was yeah that was that was the best best away day ever for me yeah. And were you? I suppose this is a question of whether you were in the Upper West because if you were, maybe not. For for the was it the Derby game and when in 2006 when we went the up as champions and then the Nottingham Forest game in 2012? Were you one of the fans running on the pitch or were you actually maybe stuck up in the gods? So, to what I remember, I've invaded the pitch a few times, but I remember I think it was the first time the Derby 
the Derby one was when we went up, wasn't it? The first, the first year we went up. Yeah, yeah. Um, that one, I remember sat up in the Upper West with my dad. Everyone's invading the pitch, and I literally begged him to let me go. Just, <laughs> call, just go under the barrier and then get on. And I remember saying, no, no, you're not going, you're not going. And, and he was really sort of, he was adamant that I wasn't going. And I remember just being so upset. And I, I think I was sat on my seat. They'd just been promoted and I'm sat there crying. Because <laughs> I wanted to go down and get on the pitch. Um, Little did you know that in a yeah, few years' time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So next time we got it, I, look, I like looked at him and I was like, I'm, go- I'm not even listening to you. I'm going. Um, <laughs> so yeah, no, I've, I've invaded it a few times. I remember... Because the, obviously the scholars all sit next to the uh, the dugout. Um, I can't remember which game it was that we did an invasion, but uh, I remember I had my Reading kit on as well, and obviously David Dodds and stuff was sat to the left of the dugout. And I remember thinking, right, I just got to keep my head down and not sort of go too far over to the dugout because they'll <laughs> see me and they'll get annoyed. So I think I just sort of like ran towards the east stand and just sort of like tried to hide sort of thing. But uh, no, they're great memories, yeah. Yeah, because that I suppose that tw- 2012 one, um, I suppose you know both of us or everyone obviously was a bit older then. And yeah. when you were, when you are so young for that 2005-6 one, I remember being, you know, it's it it almost felt like the norm that Reading just went and did this yeah. sort of crazy thing. But then as you get yeah. back to 2012, it kind of meant a little bit something different for fans of our of our age who think this is this is so much more of an achievement than you ever really realised maybe the one in 16 yeah. was. Yeah, because my dad always reminds me of that or like fa- like my dad's mates or whatever or family always remind me that throughout our, our, I don't know how old you are but throughout my whole uh, like life all I've seen for Reading is just success really um, apart from obviously a few relegations and that apart from that it's just all been up really so uh, yeah, they say it hasn't been like this all the time yeah yeah well that's the thing I'm in, I, I'm in... Uh, uh, in my mid twenties, so I've I've been blessed basically. One the early, yeah. I suppose in a way when I started the first one of the first seasons that I started watching, we lost in the playoff semi final to Wolves. So that kind of really set us up for uh, oh, right. for losing losing playoffs as a as a bit of a routine yeah. that is. Um, what one other question I wanted to ask was who of the ex of the ex players that you watched obviously during this time and and as you were growing up, what of the of those ex players have you met now and which ones have you have you been able to sort of, you know, get to talk to and have a word with that you used to look up to as a younger as a younger fan? Um, I say, I met uh, Stephen Hunt a few times as well as Noel Hunt and uh, who else? Uh, Jem Carajan, Simon Church. Uh, I've met, yeah, I've met a few more, I think. But yeah, it's always strange when you meet ex players because you don't know how much they know about you, but you know everything about them. You know what I mean? <laughs> Um, yeah, no, I get that, yeah. Which is really odd. You don't know whether they've been watching games or whatever or whether they still follow as much. But, um, no, it's great to... I still I still buzz with it, to be fair, seeing them because I, I watched all of them growing up and stuff. And I think even when I was a bit younger, I remember James Harper, like, trained with us a few times um, in the Dome as a youngster. And, and that, again, was brilliant to see someone that you've watched for so long um, and, and training with you, yeah. Yeah, you never forget your childhood heroes, and in a way for no. you as well. I would say that, from from my experience, because you're effectively on the other end of that now, and even for someone who you know you've only at the stage had a handful of games, and you're obviously early in your career, but you're already someone I would say that's made quite a big impact with fans, and someone that you know you are the person now that people go up and want to take photos with and everything. Yeah, it's always it's always strange when people say that. Um... And it's it's like my mum and dad say, like you need to go down and uh, and watch the like younger lads play and stuff, and uh, and go back to the academy and, and watch them play. And I have done a few times, but I always I always walk up thinking, like I, I think it it feels wrong. It feels wrong in a sense because I sit there and think, when I was that age, I would have buzzed off it if anyone came to watch me play. Mm. But I always do it and think, are they thinking the same thing, or they just think, what's this lad doing? To watch <laughs> him play, sort of thing, you know. Um, but yeah, it's, it's it's surreal, really, that people look look at me that way. Yeah, it's it's, it's strange, but but I, I love it all the same. Yeah. No, of course. And uh, a few just final couple of thoughts before I let you go. Then thanks very much for for coming on the podcast tonight. I know it's been something we've we've been trying to get in the works for a little while, so it's massively appreciated. And yeah, no worries. Man. As we get into hopefully now what we're end of May, so maybe we're playing within a few weeks or a month or so. Now, what's it? 
what's it sort of mean to you now to get towards the end of the season and, and to see out the year? Uh, yeah, I think I said today, I, I did an interview today with, with the guys at Reading and they asked me a similar question. Um, but it's just, it's just, it's, it's like the start of a new season, this, these games coming up, because at the start of a new season, anything can happen. Um, and you'll see some strange results. And I think we've got as good a chance as anyone of pushing for those playoff spots, really. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm massively optimistic about the, the games ahead and stuff. Hopefully we can all get it going again. Um, but yeah, it's just about doing all we can to keep fit and, uh, training hard at the same intensity that we would be throughout the season to be ready for when that, that first game comes around. Um, but yeah, it's, it's going to be obviously a tough, a tough period because there's going to be a lot of games within a short period and then sort of straight into the next season. But yeah, everyone's in the same boat and doing the same thing. So I, I think we'll smash it, yeah. No, I suppose that's a good thing for you as well, that the games come thick and fast and, and as many opportunities as possible. My last question really is that... Um, it's gonna. It, it must be a bit strange to think of playing in empty stadiums and everything like that, especially yeah. at, at championship level and everything. But how how much are you looking forward to whether it's you know October, January, whenever to have the fans back in the stadium and to kind of feel like we've you know got back to you know that that brilliant sense that probably we all took for granted of having fans in stadiums football, but to have it back now, it's it's going to feel pretty special, isn't it? Oh, for sure. Yeah, I, I haven't actually. I obviously haven't played behind closed doors in a in a in a league game yet, but I've been watching a bit of the Bundesliga and stuff, and it, it seems really odd watching it without any fans, and you can hear the players sort of talking and stuff. Um, and yeah, it does make you realise that football isn't anything without the fans, really. Um, so yeah, I think yeah, I, I can't wait to have everyone back in and stuff and enjoying the football and stuff. I think uh, it it will be a massive boost to everyone. Yeah. Absolutely, we're certainly counting down the days to when that is. But in the meantime, thank you very much for coming on, Tom. It's been a pleasure talking to you and best of luck for the rest of the season. Yeah, no worries, mate. Thanks very much for having me. Keep up to date with all things Reading FC. Follow the Tilehurst End on Facebook and Twitter.